Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar with Security Current. My name is Stephanie and I'll be your host. Today we'll be discussing the challenges of incident response and how you can automate your response procedures with incident workflows and playbooks. Before I introduce our featured speakers, I want to review a few housekeeping items and let you know how you can participate in today's session. You have joined today's webinar listening through your computer speaker system by default. If you would like to call in using the phone, just locate your audio pane and select Use Telephone. The dial-in information and access code will then be displayed. You also have the ability to ask questions using your questions pane. Simply type in your question and click Send. At the end of the presentation, we'll do a Q&A session and take as many questions as we have time for. We've uploaded today's slides and a white paper detailing our security intelligence platform in the handout pane. Feel free to access these resources at any time. Okay, enough with housekeeping. Let's welcome in today's speakers, Brian Lozada and Rick Katja. Brian serves as Chief Information Security Officer for ZocDoc. He brings more than 15 years of experience developing and maintaining information security programs for some of the world's top brands. His vision and drive have been instrumental in promoting information security within any business's workflow across several industries. Previously, Brian was Chief Information Security Officer for Abacus Group, the largest cloud provider within the financial services sector. He was responsible for the development and maintenance of Abacus's information security program. Prior to joining Abacus, Brian was Chief Information Security Officer at Condé Nast. Brian has also served several information security management positions at Sony Music Entertainment and Vonage. Welcome, Brian. Rick Kacha serves as the Chief Marketing Officer for Exabeam. He has over 15 years of experience marketing enterprise infrastructure products, most recently as CMO at Delphix, a provider of data virtualization software. Prior to Delphix, he was VP of Product and Channel Marketing at ArcSight, and prior to ArcSight, he led product management for messaging and web security products at Symantec. Earlier in his career, Rick held product marketing leadership roles at groundbreaking software companies. He has an MBA in technology marketing from UC Berkeley. And with that said, I would like to turn it over to Brian to kick things off. Brian. Thank you. I appreciate it. Appreciate your time. Uh, today, I wanted to talk a little bit about incident response challenges from a CISO's perspective. Uh, being in the CISO seat, our job is to prepare for, respond to, and recover from. Um, and it's always, you know, preparing for that incident, um, how, how to respond to that incident, how to recover from that incident. And uh, there's a lot of challenges throughout that, that entire life cycle. Uh, one of the biggest things for me is the information gathering across several tools and resources. Uh, we have a lot of tools within our environment uh, to give us visibility into our workflow, into our data. Um, and when those tools start to trigger, and they start to alert on, on these type of incidents, it's how do you pick out that information that's going to help you respond to that, that incident better or, or how, how it can help you recover from that incident better or how do you shift through that information to say this is valuable um, and this is what I need to focus on at this particular time. Um, so that, that's always you know, been a pretty big challenge for me. Um, you know, so I, I just wanted to highlight that. Uh, next thing I think that, that is pretty challenging for me is the lack of visibility uh, in, in when you're going through that information because you could lead to overlooking critical information. Looking at several tools across you know, your, your platform, how do you know that this information is, that critical information is going to help you, uh, again, respond to that incident or recover from that incident or stop that incident from, from occurring? Um, I think that, uh, that, that happens a lot when it comes to incident response. Hey, hey Brian, uh, it's Rick. I, uh, hey, hey, Brian, it's Rick. So for those first two, like how long does that typically take? Like let's say you're going through that information gathering, your, your team's going through the different tools, um, trying to get that visibility. What's that, what's that timeline, what's that process look like typically for that? You know, depending on the incident, it could be, it, it takes too long. Uh, it, you know, depending on the incident, it could take anywhere from you know, an hour to hour and a half. And, and when it comes to incident response, the longer it takes you to get that information to make a proper uh, decision to respond or to recover, the longer it takes to, to help protect your brand publicly, right? Uh, so I would say it, it's a long process. It'll probably take me uh, or my team, you know, it's not going to be under an hour for me to get the information I need to start responding accordingly. Yeah, it's funny. We've seen with some of the customers, the typical answer is hours, and we've seen some where it's, where it's days. I'm going to cover that a little bit later, but have you seen those kind of cases where it can take, you know, even a day or more? 
Absolutely. You're only as good as the information you have. Uh, so if you don't have that information or you have that information and you're overlooking it because you're looking at multiple tools or you're not picking out the things that are, uh, you know, appropriate to you, again, we're depending on, uh, you know, your, your resources and your staff uh, to, to overlook the alerts that are coming out of these tools or the, the, the logs that are coming out of these tools. So um, if you don't have that information or if you have it and you're overlooking it, uh, it, it could take up the days. And why are they overlooking it? Is it just too much data or you don't have enough people or some mix of both? I think it's a mix of both. Uh, again, as, as information security, there is a lack of talent out there. So we're doing a lot more with less uh, in, in, in environments nowadays. And just the overwhelming amount of data that a lot of these tools put out uh, to actually correlate them and, and do that manually or try to pick out that information that's going to be relevant, um, it's challenging. Okay, got it. Uh, you know, another another area, you know, following to that topic, another area that, that's challenging is, is that information sharing. Um, across, when you're responding to an incident, it's not just the information security team that's responding. You have to depend on the application team, on the systems team, uh, you know, various stakeholders throughout the organization. And when you're sharing that information, uh, if it takes you time to get it across to those team members, uh, maybe they can have relevant information about that that says, hey, I know where this IP comes from, or I know, you know, a little bit about this information. Um, I've always found that challenging. I, I would, you know, a platform that allows us to share information during incident response will help it, it, in the time to recover. And how do they, how do you share information now? Right now, it's, you know, the, the typical incident response procedures of, you know, the distros or war bridges or, uh, I want to say manual processes. It, it's still depending on uh, whatever platform you have within your organization to do it. Uh, again, whether it be a con call, whether it be a distro, whether it be, you know, getting in an actual physical war room, but getting the right stakeholders in place to actually do that too for long periods of time is always challenging. Yeah, we just talked to somebody who uh, left one of the big, you know, IR firms and he said, yeah, most of the time we just use spreadsheets. And it's like you're trying to edit shared spreadsheets and move those around, which is, you know, challenging. <laughs> yeah, I mean... <laughs> I, I would find that uh, very hard to actually do. Uh, just version controls on spreadsheets that aren't relevant to the incident response is challenging. So uh, doing that within an incident response framework got to be got to be very tough. Uh, another thing that I think you know I, I struggle with is the time gap between detection and response. Uh, so from the moment we're starting to detect things from these tools to the moment we actually respond to them, um, again depending on the incident, depending on how we've interpreted that alert. Um, it, it's a it's a long time before we say, hey, we're going to pull the trigger to actually stop blocking this or logical separation or making that response decision. Um, it, it's always, you know, a, a larger time frame than what I would I would prefer. Um, I, I would love to see tools that were more automated to my next point that would help with that. And the moment that it starts detecting things that it could say, here's the response procedure that it do. And not so much about blocking, but response more about this IP is related to X, or this is where it's coming from to help me make that decision on what I need to do from, from a next step perspective. Yeah, I saw, I saw a report um, late last year from one of the big law firms who did an in interesting thing around forensics, and um, they said on average, uh, took the average company from detection to containment uh, 50 days, 5-0, which just seems crazy to me that it would take that long to shut down a threat, but I guess that's the average time now. Uh, that is a, that seems pretty accurate, and that is it's pretty daunting that we're in 2017. There's still that that long time frame from from detection to response, and I think the average time to actually detect that you've been uh, compromised, I think it's down to 205 days uh, that you're actually going through an incident uh, compared to what it was two years ago, which was over 300 days. So I think we're getting better as an industry, but uh, I mean, we're in 2017 and we're still dealing with this, right? So. Uh, I think the next issue that I think I deal with a lot is uh, uh, eliminating false positives during during the, the analysis, right? It, it, you get a lot of these uh, alerts that are coming from your tools, and you get a lot of these, these, you're shifting through logs, and how do you know what is, what's real and what's not? And when you start going down that path of saying, this is something that I want to investigate, just to come to find out that it's a false positive, you've wasted a lot of your resources and time to do that, and you've, you've wasted a lot of response time in doing that. And again, an incident response, the more time you've wasted it in, in, in you know, going down a rabbit hole and, and not coming out with a positive outcome, um, it just impacts you know, your response procedure, it impacts how you're protecting the brand, the organization, your clients, and so on. 
Uh, next item I think that I, I struggle with too is keeping the, uh, the incident response team effective during response. Uh, to that exact point, you know, if I had them going through false positives or investigating, going down this path and it's not relevant to, to uh, the response effort, um, I think it's, it's, de it's demotivating, I think, one. And two, it's, it doesn't help with uh, you know, what we're trying to structure from a response perspective. Controlling the message out to the public when you go through a compromise is important. And again, that's all relevant to, to the information you have. And you depend on your internal response team for that. So you gotta keep them focused, keep them effective, so that you can control that message, contain the incident, and, and recover accordingly. Yeah, you know, you, you made the earlier point of it's hard to find people. I guess the combination of, and I, I see this with a lot of our customers, the combination of, hey, I've got a shortage of staff, I can't hire everyone I need, so the people I have are overworked. And then I've got an already overworked team trying to deal with more and more incidents, you know, where it's harder to figure out what's going on. It's just a recipe for burnout. Um, one thing we hear from a lot of customers is, you know, they burn out, we've trained them, they burn out and they want to go somewhere else. And it's just hard to keep people, you know, around when you can't keep them motivated. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, and I think the last point that I want to highlight, which you already, you already alluded to, was minimizing the time from response and, and, uh, and recovery. If it takes 50 days from detection to uh, response, uh, and if it's, say, it's just that, and then it's going to take me another, you know, 50 days to recover, that's too long. That's too long to protect uh, your organization, clients, consumers. Like, it, it, it's hard to, to justify that long time period. Uh, when you have all of these these great tools that give you a lot of visibility and the ability to respond, correlating them and getting them all together for an effective instant response, uh, a plan is where I think all CISOs are, are struggling, and it's a challenge. Yeah, got it. Yeah, these are these are these are the. It's great to hear this. These kind of things seem pretty common. We've probably spoken to about a hundred different firms in the past ten or twelve months. We've heard versions of all of these guys. So. Um, this was super useful. Let, let me um, let me talk a little bit about some of the things we're seeing with some customers, and as we go, I'd love to get your comments too, Brian. Um, Great. So, you know, from our perspective, from the Exabeam side, the, the 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 way we got into incident response from a product standpoint was a little bit surprising. So we started with behavioral analytics, and the point of the product was, as you mentioned, <clears throat> to help get rid of false positives and help detect, you know, in less than 200 days. Um, and that was great, worked fine. The, the big surprise question was we would increasingly show customers the product and say, hey, look, we we detected some problem. You have a breach or a data theft or something, and we'd show it during a pilot. And almost 100% of the time, <clears throat> the first question we would get back is, hey, that's great, but now what do we do? And, it, you know, it kind of would kind of scratch our heads because we'd say, well, what do you mean now what do you do? Now you, you know, you, you do your incident response. And what became clear was a lot of customers, I guess we assumed there was an incident response process and the detection was going to help that, you know, feed that process. And we found in practice was a lot of customers um, had non-existent or, you know, ad hoc kind of incident response. And where it started to show up was um, even if you could find, you could get the detection working, um, the ability to assess, you know, a set of alerts in an incident like uh, to say, well, this is actually a problem. And then to figure out how to respond in some best practices way um, was the second one. So I have to say from our perspective, kind of coming at it from a security vendor and saying, well, we can help you find these problems. And then, you know, we assume they knew what to do. Um, the fact that so many customers just didn't really know what to do and were looking for assistance um, was a bit of a surprise. So um, an interesting side was the other end of the exam, the other so the other end of the spectrum. We we also had customers like ADP, um, and ADP is the largest uh, payroll processor in the United States. Um, these guys are at the other end of the spectrum, super super experts. They really knew what they were doing, and so um, one of our customers there, Vijay La Rosa, who's the head of global security architecture, um, the way he defined his IR um, goal is. The first thing we need to do is get situational awareness. And I think you covered this, Brian, is you know, this notion of, okay, I've got an incident. My situ situational awareness means, do I even understand, should this person be doing what he's doing? Um, what's normal for this? You know, is this guy doing something he doesn't normally do? 
which um, seems like a really straightforward question. Hey, I've got an incident. This looks like it's someone doing something that's risky. You know, should they be doing that? Um, in practice, it turns out to be, you know, pretty hard to answer. And Brian, I'd love to get your thoughts on this. It is. I mean, it, it, it depends on, uh, you know, the information that you have. That, that you're looking at to say, is this normal or is this not? You're only as good as the information that you have. So if you don't have visibility into that workflow or if you don't have visibility into that part of the organization to see if it's normal or it's not, it's going to be hard to make that decision and say, is this something that's, that's going to be, you know, risky to the organization or is this normal and I'm just tracking it as a false positive or, you know, I could tune my, 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 my system so that it doesn't alert on this. Uh, it just depends on the visibility that you have into that, that part of the organization. Yeah, yeah. So a good example is something like, uh, you know, this is some data we got from one of the customers. It's something like this. You'd say, well, okay, well, let me determine normal. So here are some things I'm seeing a user, B. Salazar, do. You know, is this normal? So I see B. Salazar coming in via VPN from Ukraine. I see B. Salazar accessing, you know, server 1453, server 1452. Um, separately, I see a database admin uh, user uh, doing a backup of a payroll database. I see some IP uh, starting to do an FTP to some uh, cloud file share. You know, if you're someone on the IR team trying to figure out if this is supposed to happen or not, it's pretty hard because someone on that team almost certainly doesn't know who, you know, B. Salazar is. And especially if I'm outsourcing the SOC to an MSP or I'm outsourcing the operations, even if it's on site, to a consulting firm or something like that, being able to figure out you know, if these things are normal, is, is pretty hard. And the kind of questions people look at as part of their IR process in this case might be like, okay, I see Bar uh, B. Salazar coming in over VPN from the Ukraine. They've been able to answer something like, does she normally do this? You know, has she ever done it before? It's pretty critical, but can be hard. You know, does anyone else go to these servers she's going to, 1453 or 1452? You know, has she ever done it? I don't know. I've got to find out. Um, I see a particular database admin doing what looks like a backup of a payroll database. You know, is that acceptable? Well, I don't know. It seems okay. The DBAs do backups of databases. I, I guess that's okay. And then, you know, I see I see someone, uh, an IP, trying to FTP out to the cloud. You know, is that okay? What what IP is this? What's this target? These are the kind of things that I think are part of, um, Brian, let me get your, your comment. These are the kind of things that seem like <clears throat> they're part of that normal IR process of, you know, hey, I'm in the fog of war in the middle of an incident. You know, how do I get situ situational awareness? You know, do your teams look for this kind of stuff? You know, what, how do they do this today? No, that's a good point. They do, right? And you have to look at, uh, you have to dig down all of these these alerts, right, and say, uh, is this normal? You have to reach out to those teams and say, is this what the, the B. Salazar typically does? Is this part of her workflow? Is this, is she coming from the Ukraine? Is she a remote employee? Is she on vacation? Like, Giving, investigating all of that takes time. Uh, so I, I think that's, that's, that's an issue. The other thing, I, you highlighted it too earlier, was about, uh, you know, outs outsourced uh, stocks. I mean, how many of your customers actually have a separate, you know, incident response team outside of their own, their own stock? Uh, a lot of organizations do outsource their response um, and incorporate as part of their, their response team. Do, do you have a lot of customers that do that? It, I tell you, it's all over the map. So what we've seen is, there's a lot of customers who don't even have a SOC or they may not have a SIM, you know, they're not even collecting the data or if they are, they don't have an actual dedicated SOC. The ones that do, some of them, have the SOC handles IR. In other cases, the IR team is a separate team. Um, so I haven't seen anything that's consistent. You know, it's, it's, it's pretty rare, I'd say, to, to find the sort of the perfect customer where they're collecting everything they want, they can get to it quickly, they have a well-functioning SOC to evaluate alerts. They have a well-staffed IR team that knows what to do. You know, finding all of those things together tends to be more rare than you'd expect. And even if they're starting to do things like outsourcing, they don't outsource everything. So what they might say is, well, I'm going to send, you know, low-level alerts, um, kind of tier one sort of things to my MSP. But for more important things and sensitive things, I certainly don't want that. I want to have a team here that does it. So even when we're seeing, you know, an IR team or, or an MSP, it's not one way or the other. They split the stuff between the two. And, and from my perspective, I've seen that as well. I've used that, that model as well. 
the information sharing piece is where it becomes a challenge for me. And doing that rapidly between outsource and insource, it's hard. I mean, it, it, again, it goes back to that response time. Uh, so if it's an effective model because you need to do it for resources perspective, cost perspective, I get it. But sharing that information effectively in a timely manner uh, for, for response is where I, I, I feel like there's a lot of challenges. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I hear that a lot. So here's, you know, we ask the customer to say, okay, today you get an incident, you're trying to get situational awareness, you're trying to figure out, answer those questions, should this person be doing it, do they normally do it? You know, ask, how do you do it? And the answer was pretty interesting. So the answer that BJ said was, well, look, here's what we do. You know, we run a query in our, in our, um, our SIM, you know, our Splunk. And I said, but those, you know, you're trying to figure out if someone, if this is normal behavior, which means you're running really complex queries against maybe 90 days of data. You know, depending on your system, that query could take three, four, five hours to run. And then you get the answer back. You say, well, uh, maybe I made an error there. I need to tweak it and rerun it another five hours. Then I want to pivot the query a bit, you know, change some parameters, rerun it. You know, customers will say running those queries that take four or five hours, you know, running them the three or four times I need to to even answer the basic question of does this guy normally do what he's doing right now, you can easily lead, lose three or four days just waiting for the darn queries to finish, which is, which is kind of mind-blowing. You know, just that time of query, pivot, query, pivot, with enough data, the answers can take a lot longer than people expect. I've seen that myself. I mean, you're absolutely right. Uh, but again, it, it's, you're depending on these tools, and you're right. It, the query could take a long time depending on your resources to support that query. Uh, I'm talking from a technical perspective, but that's the challenges we face. I mean, it, 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 we're, we're at the mercy of the tools and the resources we have, and it, 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 it makes that response time so much longer for us. Yeah, and then, and then I asked, so this is the other one. I asked one of, our, one of the IR managers and one of the customers, I said, okay, so you know, do you see that? And he said, yeah, but he said, it's even worse than that. He said, that assumes that I have the Splunk Ninja on staff when this incident comes in to actually run those queries. He said, you know, if, if my, my Ninja is on the shift where this comes in, that guy might know how to do it. But if that guy's on vacation and I've got, you know, my person on the left here is kind of my, my newbie who doesn't know what he's doing, he may not even be able to get to the point to know how to run those queries um, that take the four hours. So, you know, best case, you have the person who knows what they're doing and it just takes a long time. But with some of these staffing shortages, it may be hard enough even to get that. I agree with that. I mean, I, again, we're, at, we're in a talent shortage in the industry uh, for getting the right talent during incident response. And hey, people go on vacation, they get sick. So it, it's always pretty challenging. Yeah, yeah. So um, from our perspective, what we did was um, we had already, we had recently, we had already had um, the behavioral analytics piece to help with the detection. Um, we added a log manager piece, which I'm not gonna talk about today, and then we added an incident response automation piece, which I'll talk a little bit about and kind of show a demo of. And the goal was to um, go after some of these things. We thought, you know, you're never gonna automate the real thinking work. It just, it's a, I think it's a false promise uh, to say you're gonna automate, you know, what smart humans can do, but you can automate a lot of the grunt work and you can automate a lot of the basic process so then when it does get to those overworked, scarce people who, who, you know, as Brian said, need to be kept effective, you can make sure they're not burning time on things that, um, that, that really aren't there. Um, so uh, one of the key things that, that we found was um, there was a piece of data structure we use in the analytics um, that turned out to be super, super useful for incident response. And this kind of ties back to my example before. Um, we used this thing we called stateful sessions, which was for each particular user to stitch together all the logs automatically uh, from log in to log off within a session, and most importantly, to hold state as they change credentials or devices. And we found this to be a huge time sink for IR folks. And I'll give you this example. So let's go with this thing on the left. I've got this woman, Barbara Salazar. Um, uh, I don't have these stateful sessions. She logs in. Uh, she logs in, does her work, you know, does her thing. Halfway through the day, um, she remotely logs into um, a Unix database, a different machine, and uses a shared DBA account, DB admin, and does some work. Maybe X, maybe uh, does that backup on the payroll database. 
what we found was, you know, without any way of tying these two together, you know, all the security products and then the, the IR team dealing with this, you know, every, each of these sessions looks fine. You know, Barbara's doing Barbara stuff. DBA admin is doing DBA stuff. And that's okay. Um, it becomes very difficult, you know, to figure out, hey, this is actually the same person doing two credentials. And in fact, this is a sign of a potential hack. So what we're able to do is to say, okay, let me let me hold state, and I can show that it's actually Barbara doing the Barbara stuff, and then Barbara leaves her machine and remotely connects to this database system, does some backup of the database, and then continues her day. And if you can actually tie this whole timeline together and positively attribute this to a person, um, you can not only detect, but if you're that incident responder, you can very quickly um, remove all the work of saying, hey, is this normal? Because you can, the system can show you Barbara is acting as and using the shared DBA account, but she's not a DBA. She's never logged into this payroll database before. No one in HR, where she's with her department, is doing it. Now suddenly the whole thing of is this normal, it becomes very clear that it's not normal. And it's much easier to see that you, know, you may have a compromised account. And we found that that was super useful for the detection, but it's turned out to be just as equal, equally useful for, um, for response. So, you know, Brian, I'd love to get your thoughts on, you know, how do teams do this kind of super detective work uh, without any sort of automation? Is it even possible? Uh, it's, it, it, without, it's not possible. I mean, you're doing this as a manual aspect. You're, you're going through that user's workflow, finding out as much as you possibly can, uh, finding out that, hey, she's in HR, She's never done this DBA query before. To just find that information out, I mean, that that could be days worth of work uh, to, to 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 investigate on. Uh, so again, it's a, it's a very manual and slow process. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> so the first thing we did with it was, you know, where we came from was we we manifested that data structure, that stateful session. Um, within these automated investigation timelines. So the, the, the product sort of slopped a little bit from detection into response in terms of building this investigation timeline. And uh, one customer put it really well. He said, listen, we all love the show Law and & Order and CSI, but you know, those sh the shows aren't about finding the smoking gun. They find the smoking gun in the first five minutes of the TV show. The rest of the hour is about building the investigation and figuring out what actually happened and that's where the hard stuff happens. So um, these stateful sessions could automatically build this timeline and show, okay, this is what a user did, you know, this is what she did here, this is what she did next. You know, that part was hard. It was hard to do manually. So we found that getting that situational awareness through the timeline um, and not wasting time was, was a pretty effective thing to do. Um, and then the next piece was, okay, once you've got this sort of timeline, you understand what the situation is, you know, then the question is, okay, what do I do? <laughs> and this is where this notion of these automated playbooks, um, and automated um, response preparation comes in. I think this is actually a really great time um, to be in, in, in IT security because there's a lot of new technology being built to help people automate some of the stuff that wasn't there before. I mean, I came out of the SIM industry, you know, I was at ArcSight for years, and what we found was those products created just as much work for SOC and IR teams as they, you know, as they were supposed to eliminate because they just didn't help with, they could help with kind of a build a case and case management, but they didn't help with the workflow. So there's just too much grunt work. So um, you're not going to be able to automate away, you know, what a smart human can do. But if you could automate a lot of that grunt work and build it into these best practices so that when even a junior analyst gets to, you know, their, their IR workbench, they know, what all, they know what all the basic information is and they know what steps to take, you know, that can be pretty dramatic. So, Brian, I'd love to get your thoughts on that, Brian. Agreed. I mean, getting information that's actually actionable uh, instead of getting information that you still have to do more investigation or tie things together. Uh, you, hit, you said a specific word that is a very important timeline. In incident response, establishing a timeline to saying this is what we know based on the timeline, it helps during the investigation phase. If you're investigating something that you can't map it back to a timeline, you don't even know when the incident started or ended, right? So uh, getting in actionable information is the most important part during, during incident response. 
Yeah, so, so let me show a little demo of how that might get automated. Um, so kind of workflow I can have, you know, I can look at my, my overall console. I'm a guy in a SOC or on an IR team, and I see that I've got a new notable user. She's got a high risk score, 235. And I can look and I can see, okay, the system's built that whole timeline. I can see, okay, she came in from the Ukraine. You know, does she normally do it? Well, I can look and see, no, normally she doesn't. She's normally a U.S. user. Um, I start to see her hit some of these servers. I've never seen her do it before. I see her go to a system and switch accounts from her B. Salazar to a, to a uh, system admin account. I see her go to a Microsoft SQL Server database and use a switched account. So you start to see this, this timeline gets built quickly. And if you're the IR analyst, you look at this and say, okay, this looks bad. This is that this timeline tells me that, you know, this is not, this looks risky. I want to do something about it. So the, the cool thing you can do then is to go over and say, let me go to my, um, let me go to my incident response um, uh, uh, console and say, okay, I've got an, I respond. this has been created here for Barbara. I can look at it and go, okay, I can see all my stuff in one place. I can see all the attached entities. I can see um, any sort of artifacts like logs from the blue coat system where she was trying to send something out. I can look at other things, um, but that's great. But then I want to say, okay, the most important thing is what the heck do I do? And I can flip to the workbench and say, well, okay, there's nothing here yet. But I can go and run my run an attached playbook and say my UBA um, has shown that that um, there's an incident here. Let me launch my playbook, and it's going to run, and it's going to automatically go out and start to um, do some of the background work. So it's going to say, well, we've um, we we uh, we stripped off the attachments. Uh, so we went out. And we we looked at. Um, uh, inbound emails from that particular sender. Um, we see that uh, Barbara received one suspicious email in the last week. There's probably some sort of malware there. I want to investigate that. I want to see who else got it so I can see the other two users got it. I want to strip off the malware and automatically send it out. Here I send it to Cisco Threat Grid to detonate the attachment. I get a threat score back. Okay, that's high. We have a problem. Let me maybe geolocate where that thing came from. It came from Ukraine strip off any other notable attachments, and then see anyone else um, who sent this thing. And so now uh, the cool thing here is I've very quickly taken um, a bunch of steps that, you know, maybe are written down and maybe they're not, but when I have a user who looks like she's been compromised by malware and I've got a hacker using her credentials to move around the network, I can quickly go and kind of collect all the grunt work information I need and present that, you know, reputation information, uh, sandbox detonation, everything else, and present it very quickly um, for, for my, my analyst and have them, you know, very quickly see what to do and maybe run other playbooks that say, let's, um, let's re-image this woman's machine, let's change her password, let's do whatever else we need to do. And these kind of things become, you know, automatic. And whether I've got my ninja or my, you know, person who's the second day on the job, they get the same benefit from all this. So, you know, Brian, I'd love to get your take on on on, on uh, benefit for this for an IR team. I think this is huge benefit. The, the amount of work that you just automated or just brought up, uh, so that you could make it actionable, uh, is days worth of work. It literally is days worth of work to actually look at all of this, uh, like even to exploit something in the cloud, like you said, either a threat grid or whatever other uh, you know, service that you are using, um, just to find that out, that information, to do a mail trace to say this is malicious and two other individuals within the organization got that, right? Doing a mail trace is not that hard, but uh, to find out that you had to, it had to, that it was Barbara, going through your exchange or your old 365 or wherever you're outsourcing your, your, your mail to to do that, it's, it's, uh, it's very time consuming to actually do that. So uh, th this information is incredibly useful. It makes it again. It makes it back to that point where it's actionable. You know, you could actually make a decision um, to to help improve response. Great. Well, um, we think so for sure. Um, so I thought we would, um, you know, move to some questions, and we kind of wrap it up before we go to questions. Um, 
So, um, you know, I think the thing I want to summarize today is, you know, here are some of the challenges we've talked about. You know, it's being able to very quickly figure out, hey, what's my situation? Is this, is this incident, is this person, what they're doing normal or not? How do I gather the appropriate information, you know, quickly, as Brian mentioned? How do I make sure I accurately figure out, is this severe, you know, is this, is this, is this an issue? Is it risky? How do I not burn my team out spending time on false positives? <clears throat> How do we share information across the team members so that dashboard I talked about, you can put in comments and share those. And then, I think, you know, um, security professionals uh, don't want to burn time on grunt work. They want to use their brains. And so you want to be able to automate away a lot of that grunt work. I think one of the great things is, you know, the orchestration and automation products that exist today can shorten that assessment window. Um, they're not going to automate away um, the human brain. I think anyone who tells you that is probably uh, lying. But, you know, you can automate away a lot of the grunt work. Uh, I've got a great quote here from the CISO at another company at Levi's, um, you know, talking about look, my expertise is at a premium. Products that can help me with this stuff are going to help. I think that message came through loud and clear um, from Brian today. So um, I'll thank you for that. Um, with that, why don't we uh, maybe take a few questions here. Um, you, everyone on the call, should have um, their chat window. There's a question window. You can put um, you can put questions in there. We've got a bunch coming in, and we'll start working our, our way through. Um, so the first one <clears throat> from Scott said, the examples here speak to an outsider accessing the systems from Ukraine, for example. How can this be leveraged to monitor, in, monitor internal anomalies? Um, yeah, good question, Scott. So um, that was just an example we used. Uh, you could use the same kind of thing to build uh, behavioral profiles of normal access internally. You know, you may see, um, uh, there was an example on the papers today, you know, in the news today, uh, where Google Waymo, you know, the self-driving company is suing one of their ex-employees who went to Uber and they said, this guy downloaded 14,000 design docs before he left. Um, you could apply the same kind of behavioral analytics to for those kind of things. Say, hey, this is somebody who normally doesn't do this. They're suddenly doing it. Um, they're starting to copy data, you know, to thumb drive. They don't normally do that. You can apply the same sort of thing. I just happen to use this external example um, the whole way through. There's nothing unique tied to it. Uh, okay, another question um, from Ramesh. Um, won't these types of products just add more alerts uh, that the responder has to manage? Um, yeah, that's a good question. We hear that sometimes. Um, the goal is to cut down on the noise. Um, you know, so what these behavioral systems do, I'll talk about the detection because that's that's kind of where the noise would typically come from. Um, where what these behavioral systems do is uh, they will suck in and sort of profile um, logs for each user and try to figure out what normal behavior is. And rather than just throw a bunch of alerts, which are pretty noisy at, a, at an IR team or a SOC team, um, they'll be able to say, listen, but in this particular case, he's doing something he doesn't normally do. So when it works well, um, you have way fewer things to, to, to get to. You know, we've talked to customers, they may say, you know, we're seeing something like an 80% reduction in alerts that we have to triage. Um, so if it works well, it's, it's, um, it's less work, not more. Um, okay, hold on, more questions. Okay, uh, question, how do you build these playbooks? Um, so we ship with a bunch, and then there's a tool that helps you build more. Uh, for some customers, you know, they don't want to do it, so we, we have a, a team that does it for you. Um, pretty easy to build these things. Uh, we expect uh, more and more partners to build them and kind of offer them. Uh, we ship with a bunch that are, that are the most common ones. So some of the common ones we see are a user's infected with malware, um, a user got a phishing email, uh, playbook for... Um, data exfiltration, I'm seeing something that looks like data exfiltration that goes to, to um, Scott's question. Uh, a lot of these are just there um, and you can just use them or modify them right out of the box. Okay, I have two more questions that are similar um, around how do you deploy the product 
um, what kind of log systems does it work with? So I'm combining those into one. Um, there's the, I would say, you know, Brian asked earlier about um, do customers have a separate IR team? And I touched on it a bit. We even have a bunch of customers who don't have any sort of log system. Um, so the way you deploy it is if you had a log management system, and we work with any of them, we work with all of them, then you'd plug this, the, the detection piece and the IR piece into it. Um, if you didn't have a log system, we have one you can use. Um, there's a question here about pricing. They're all priced by user and not volume, so uh, it's a very fixed price, kind of uh, cost-effective way to do it. And um, you can plug the detection piece in, or if you already have some other detection you like, like your SIM correlation or some behavioral analytics other than ours, you can just plug the incident response module in, and it would, um, the model we have is not tied to the behavioral piece. We sort of see the IR piece as um, incident response for everything. So an example I didn't show today was, you know, it might just be, hey, your semantic antivirus um, has, it creates an incident, and you want to feed that in here, and you want to run a playbook that just cleans up after, you know, some sort of malware that comes in. That works fine. So it's pretty easy to deploy. Um, you can do it as an appliance or as a, as a VM, you can run it in the cloud, um, all pretty straightforward. Uh, question from Tim, what integrations currently exist? Uh, we've got parsers for about a thousand systems right now. So that's, you know, parsing log data into a, into a model that could be used for detection or for the IR piece. Um, on outbound, you know, it's pretty easy. We just we just invoke APIs and other systems. So we've got APIs for API-based integration to pretty much all the other major security products you might have. Uh, we find in general it's pretty easy to add a new one. You can do it overnight. Uh, it's part of that fixed price thing I talked about. So, you know, customer comes in and says, well, I've got not service now, but I've got remedy for ticketing. I want you to pull things from there. You know, you can do it overnight. Um, or if they have some other kind of endpoint system, and they want us to go out and, and integrate to send send a command to re, you know shut down a user. That generally happens overnight uh, to build the, build the integration. Um, okay, so I think we're coming up to the end. Um, and with that, let me turn it back over to Stephanie. And I want to say uh, thanks, Brian, for doing this. I had a blast, and I hope everyone else did too. And with that, I'll pass it to Stephanie. Okay, thank you both for the great discussion and thanks to all of our attendees for joining us today. Many of you have asked through the question panel about the recording, so look for an email from us on Monday with the archive recording of today's session. You can access the slides and a white paper that details our security intelligence platform in the handout pane, and you guys can download those today. If you're ready to see our incident response product in action, please visit us at exabeam.com forward slash product forward slash demo to request a live demo. Thanks again for joining us, and we look forward to hearing from you soon.